Let us retell an old story and see how well you know it. It was the period of Suitang in China. With the end of long-term divisions and wars, the unified country prospered and people were at peace. China was entering a golden age, and while the people of the Middle Kingdom had built a glorious civilization, their most important achievement was undoubtedly the preservation and dissemination of Buddhism. Around the time of Master Shandao's birth, Buddhism was undergoing a renaissance in China. Emperor Wen had reunified the nation under the Sui dynasty and adopted policies of ruling the nation according to Buddhism and the reinvigoration of Buddhism. He also issued an edict to revive the country's Buddhist monasteries. The eight Mahayana schools, which had developed over the generations since the Buddha's teachings first entered the country, provided the public with eight theoretical systems to guide their practices. Many eminent monks were active, promoting the Dharma according to the doctrines of their respective schools. Nearly all aspects of life in China came under the influence of the Dharma. It was during this time that Master Shandao chose to come as an emanation from the pure land of infinite light. Born in the ninth year of the Daye period of the Sui dynasty, he witnessed the worldly misery of political upheaval and armed conflict at an early age. These sufferings were no doubt burned into his memory. Perhaps because of this, Master Shandao took monastic vows at the age of eleven in Mijou, Shandong province. His teacher was Master Mingsheng, a student of the Three Treatises school, who was celebrated by his contemporaries. Under his teacher's careful tutelage, he learned such Mahayana scriptures as the Lotus Sutra and the Vimalakirti Sutra. These sutras teach that Buddhahood is the final goal of Dharma practice, and that all beings have the capacity to reach this lofty height as they possess the Buddha nature. Inspired by his studies, Master Shandao began an earnest quest for the Dharma path that would liberate sentient beings and lead them all to Buddhahood. One day, Master Shandao came upon a portrait of the Western Land of Bliss, which depicts the splendors of Amitabha's pure land. Everything there emits wondrous, multicolored lights. The land is vast, and the ground is composed of pure gold, but soft. The water of eight meritorious virtues in the seven jeweled lotus ponds is crystal clear, flowing warm or cool as one wishes. The various beings, plants and pavilions exude a sense of joy, tranquility and majesty. By simply seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting or touching anything in their environment, the beings of the land of bliss become enlightened and progress towards Buddhahood swiftly and naturally. Having viewed this image, Master Shandao was deeply moved and developed an aspiration for gaining rebirth there. He said, Life's ultimate aim should be the Western Pure Land. Gaining rebirth there on a blooming lotus must be splendid and sublime. From then on, he made rebirth in the land of bliss his sole objective and never wavered in his conviction for a second. After receiving full monastic precepts at the age of 20, Master Shandao read the Contemplation Sutra together with Vinaya Master Miao Kai. With a mixture of sadness and joy, he exclaimed, 
The other practices are all circuitous, remote, and hard to accomplish. Only through this one in the Contemplation Sutra can we transcend the cycle of rebirth. Master Shandao then went to Wu Jen Monastery on Mount Zhongnan to practice the meditations of the Contemplation Sutra. With but a few years' effort, he achieved a profound and marvelous state of contemplative samadhi and could literally see all the scenes of the land of bliss as if they were right before him. At this time, Master was in his twenties and was practicing without the guidance of an accomplished teacher. His achievement was incredible. No wonder Master Daoxuan, the founder of the Vinaya school, who was seventeen years older than Master Shan Dao, recorded Master Shan Dao's achievements in his biographies of prominent monastics continued. Clearly, this first-hand experience of the Pure Land informed Master Shan Dao's writings. The words and phrases just spilled out of him naturally. The images are refined and lively, with no trace of artifice. They seem entirely natural. Despite all of his achievements, Master Shan Dao did not believe that he had plumbed the Dharma to its profoundest depths. So he continued traveling extensively in search of the true Dharma. On hearing that Master Dao Chuo was teaching the essence of the Contemplation Sutra in Jinyang, Shanxi province, he made his way to pay a visit to this older master. Master Dao Chuo had inherited the lineage of Master Tan Luan, which focused exclusively on faith in Amitabha Buddha's deliverance and recitation of Amitabha's name. He expounded the Contemplation Sutra some two hundred times and was known far and wide. Emperors respected him, and ordinary people followed his teachings. Even the local children knew how to practice Amitabha recitation. As Master Shan Dao set out to visit Master Dao Chuo, it was early winter. The falling snow and freezing wind soon made travel impossible. Sheltering from the bitter cold, Master took cover in a pit filled with fallen leaves. He sat down and focused on reciting Amitabha's name. Days passed, until he suddenly heard a voice out of nowhere, telling him it was okay to move on, there would be no further obstacles. Master immediately forgot his fatigue, continued his journey, and reached his destination soon after. Dao Chuo was delighted to receive him. He also quickly realized that this young visitor would be his Dharma heir. So Dao Chuo thoroughly explained to him the true meaning of the Contemplation Sutra and Amitabha Buddha's fundamental vow. Under the guidance of Master Dao Chuo, all of Shan Dao's doubts melted away, and he grasped the profound meaning of the Contemplation Sutra. He came to understand the surest way of attaining rebirth is not actually through the visualization of Amitabha Buddha, but rather through the simple recitation of the Buddha's name. This latter method is far easier than the former, and most importantly, exclusive recitation of Amitabha's name invariably leads to rebirth in the land of bliss, as the process relies on the power of Amitabha Buddha's great vow. Every sentient being could be 100% certain of attaining rebirth in the pure land through uttering the Buddha's name with a mind of simple trust. After Master Dao Chuo passed away at 84 years of age, Master Shan Dao returned to Wu Jen Monastery. 
He was 33 at the time. This was during the Zhengguan period of the Tang Dynasty. Emperor Taizong was on the throne and ruled a newly reunified country with efficiency and justice. It could be argued that this era represented the height of ancient Chinese civilization. You may be surprised to hear that thievery and pickpocketing almost vanished throughout the land. People didn't bother to lock their doors at night, and even the prisoners awaiting execution on death row were numbered at a mere 29 people. It was truly a prosperous and golden age. Chen Dao found that although the Contemplation Sutra was popular in Buddhist circles, each school's interpretation rested on the basis of their own teachings. Thus, the true meaning of the sutra became distorted and impossible to understand. In order to correct this situation, Master Shandao wrote his four fascicle commentary on the Contemplation Sutra. Before he started writing, he paid his respects before the Buddha, asking for inspiration and guidance. That very night, he had a sacred vision in which Buddhas and Bodhisattvas appeared before him. Thenceforth, a monk would appear in his dreams every night to instruct him about the profound and hidden meanings of the text. When his work was done, the saintly being disappeared. Chen Dao put the final touches on his commentary, then again asked for assistance. Three nights in succession, he had sacred visions. A full account of these events can be found in part four of the commentary. In the process of propagating the exclusive Nyanfo, it was inevitable that Master Shen Dao would meet opposition. Once, he was debating the virtues of Amitabha recitation with Master Jing Gang in Xi Jing Monastery. The latter insisted on the impossibility of a single recitation of Amitabha's name resulting in rebirth in the Western Land of Bliss. Master Shen Dao observed his opponent's karmic nature and realized that he could only be convinced by a miraculous sign. So, Shen Dao swore an oath. If the teachings of the Buddha in various sutras that reciting Amitabha's name once or ten times, for a day or a week, invariably leads to rebirth in the pure land, is truthful and not deceitful. May the two Buddha images in this hall emit light. If the teaching is false, fails to bring rebirth in the pure land, or deceives sentient beings, may I immediately fall from this high seat into hell and suffer there eternally. He then pointed his staff at the images in the hall, which emitted light. Seeing this, Master Jing Gong fell to the floor and prostrated himself, apologizing for his offense of doubt. From that time onward, he followed Master Shen Dao's instructions and practiced single-mindedly. Master Shen Dao was extremely earnest and industrious in his daily activities. On entering the hall, he would press palms together and kneel with his right knee on the ground. He single-mindedly recited the name of Amitabha Buddha, never stopping until he was exhausted. When practicing, he would sweat 
even when it was cold. It was a mark of his extreme sincerity. For three decades, he had no place specially used for sleeping and never took naps. He would not remove his monk's garments except when bathing. He observed monastic discipline down to the finest detail. Never did he let his gaze linger upon women. He respected everyone and would not accept reverences even from novice monks. He scrupulously avoided fame and profit, as well as idle talk and joking. He always traveled alone, never with an entourage. He was reluctant to discuss worldly affairs, lest it interfered with his practice. Everywhere he went, people would compete to make offerings to him. He would not take for himself the abundant amounts of food, drink, and clothing, but always gave them to others. The fine food he redistributed to his followers. The coarse food he ate himself. He never took cheese or fine cream. He never asked anyone to wash his set of three monastic robes, his water bottle, or his alms bowl. When he saw dilapidated monasteries or pagodas, he would renovate or repair them. Every year, he ensured their lamps were lit. Master Shan Dao was so accomplished at his recitation that light would emanate from his mouth whenever he invoked the name of Amitabha Buddha. The light continued to issue forth even if he made a hundred or a thousand recitations. In later times, Shan Dao was known as Master Zhongnan, since he lived on Mount Zhongnan, or Master Light, because of the radiance he emitted during his recitations. <laughs>